morning. Welcome to Res. Um, we ask that you would uh, rise and sing with us. Good morning and welcome to worship at Resurrection this morning. It's great to have you here battling through the snow to get here. You may be seated. If you're joining us online, a special welcome to you as well. Great to have you um, tuning in. A few announcements before we continue in our worship. This evening there is a dark as light service at 7 o'clock. I invite you to come to that if you are able. Um, Sarah is going to be sharing. This is Bonnie Rachenko and Matt McLeod's sister going to be sharing a bit of her story. Along with that will be worship and communion as well. This evening, seven o'clock here at Resurrection. Some of you are uh, relatively new to Resurrection and would like to get more involved in the prayer ministry aspects of the church. You, we would be excited to have you participate in that. There's a bit of an orientation session planned on Wednesday, March 13th at 10.30. If you would like to come to that, you'll get some of the uh, lowdown on being part of things like prayer chain, 
um, serving in the prayer corner, uh, Wednesday morning prayer group, whatever would fit your schedule that you would like to be involved with, I'd like to get you informed on that. If that time doesn't work, midweek on a, in a morning, and I know for many of you that would not work, um, feel free to let us know if you are interested in any of those aspects of prayer ministry, and either Pastor Greg or myself would be glad to connect with you about that. I'm going to invite uh, Ashlyn to come up for an announcement pertaining to a women's ministry retreat event that's coming up in just a few weeks. Hello, my name is Ashlyn Burdett, and I'm part of the women's ministry team here at Res. Um, we're getting very excited for our one-day women's retreat that's coming up in two weeks. On March 16th, we have a speaker, author, and podcaster, Gretchen Ronovic, here to share with us. She will be speaking on themes from her book, Ragged, Spiritual Disciplines for the Spiritually Exhausted. In her book, Gretchen writes, This book is for people who are tired and weary of charts and checklists, and more specifically, they're tired of failing at all of that. They don't want to add to their pile of partially filled out planners. This is for the people who are ragged. Gretchen discusses spiritual disciplines like scripture readings and memorization, prayer and fasting, meditation, confession, generosity, mourning, and dis uh, disciplineship. She goes on to write, These disciplines teach us how he is sufficient and the purpose of growth is a greater dependence on him. Must you do all these things? Let's be honest. We don't need any more things on our to-do lists. We need more God, not more clutter. I'm really excited for this event, and I would love to invite all of the women from our church to attend and encourage you to bring a friend. The cost for the event is $30, and it includes a delicious lunch. If you haven't registered already, please do so as soon as possible. You can go to the RES website to register or talk to Inga in the office for assistance. I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, Ashlyn. And the last announcement, in just a few weeks, we're into March now, on the 23rd of March, that's a Saturday, there's going to be a high school choir from Hillcrest in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, here to perform. Um, they're coming a long way. They're one of our denominational high school's um, choirs that they send out, about 50 high school students that will be here. Um, it's discouraging to go on a choir tour and have just a handful of people in the audience. So I strongly encourage you, if you can mark your calendar to be here that evening, Saturday evening, March 23rd at 7, and bring a friend with you. We would love to pack out this place so that they can feel encouraged, those high school students. The name of their, uh, their tour is Cornerstone. So when you see this ad, it's not referring to the high school in Kingman. It's uh, a tour that is being done by Hillcrest. We are blessed to have lots of youth in our church, and today this is a youth-led worship service. The worship team in the front is all youth-led. You were greeted by youth, and uh, youth are going to be leading us throughout this service. And their youth leader, one of the youth leaders, Mackenzie, is going to be bringing the message today. I'm going to invite Leaf to come up, and he's going to lead us in our call to worship this morning. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no, no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And like a strong man ruins his course with joy, its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from the hidden vaults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. 
Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Here ends the reading. So my name is Shalane, and I, you can take a seat, I am here to give you the children's message. So are there any kids here? If you are a kid and feel brave enough to come up, you can feel free to come up, but if you don't want to, that's okay. So who here knows what this is? Oh, there you go. Do you know what this is? <gasps> Garrick does. 
How much money is this? Fifty dollars? Here, Garrick, you can you come up too. You both of you. And you, you can come up to the stage. So here you can here, you can hold it. Now. Now I want you, what's your name? Jesse, I want you to throw it on the floor and stomp on it. Okay, very good. Now pick it up. Oh, yep, yeah, good. Good job, Garrett. Now pick it up. Now how much money is it worth? Think about it really hard. What number does it say on there? 50? Are you sure? Hmm. Okay, well, let's see. How about, Garrick, you take it, and I want you to crumple it up. Here, you help him, Jesse. You pass it, Jesse. Crumple it up even more. So much. Okay, unravel it. Unravel it. Let's see what number does it say. Uh, it's pretty crumpled now. Do you think it's more like $20 now? Yeah, it's more like 20 It does look a little wrinkled. If I took it to the store, do you think I would be able to buy, like, maybe one chocolate bar now that it's a little crumpled up? No. How much money is it worth now? It's still worth $50. Let's see. Well, what if you put it on Garrick's head? <gasps> Did it change it now? No. If I took it to the bank, how much money would they say it was? $50? No way. So what if in life we start out like a crisp $50 bill, but then sometimes crumply things happen to us. Again, I'll let you crumple it again. You probably don't have another chance to do it. Things in life can crumple us up. We can get stomped on. We can get crumpled. We can even get thrown in the mud. And even though things like that happen to money, our value in God never, ever changes. And we are worth way more than $50 in God's eyes. We are priceless. God sent his one and only son. He gave up everything he could um, to pay for our debt. And that's way more, um, that goes way farther than any crumpling or anything that we can um, go through. So thanks, guys, so much for helping me. You can go back to your seats. And now, um, that was the children's message. <laughs> We are gathered in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now is our regular time for our offering prayer, so there are a multitude of ways that you can give, either online or in the boxes at the back, but let us join in a word of prayer. We bring you what is yours, Father, that you might use this offering and the giver for the building up of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. I invite Garrick up to do our second reading, which comes from 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 18. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life is but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak. Knowing that we, who raised the Lord Jesus will rise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it all is for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, so that so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For his light mo momentarily afflicting affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, 
but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Here ends our reading. In your bulletin, you'll find a list of congregational prayers. Please bow your hearts with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your power, that it is at work in us, that we are frail vessels. You still choose to work through us, your body. Lord, we pray for the hardship and despair and persecution that we praise you that it cannot overcome those who are hidden in Christ Jesus. Lord, we lift up to you the special needs for the light of Christ to shine through God's people and bring hope to those who are walking in darkness. We pray for all in the body of Christ to be able to find ways of using their gifts to glorify you, God. Lord, we pray specifically for members of our resurrection family, for Ken and Lee Birch, for Grace, Barry and Joan Bishop, for Danielle Biswanger, Jennifer Biswanger, and Glenn and Pam Biswanger. Lord, thank you for these essential members of our family here and that you have let them be a part of this body. God, we pray for some needs out in the world. We pray that you would bring peace to the conflict in the Middle East and that in Russia and Ukraine. God, we pray for your provision for those who are hungry and in distress. You know the needs of even the birds, Lord, and you do not let them go hungry. How much more valuable are we than birds? And God, we pray for expecting families in our congregation, Colin and Emily Halverson. Lord, we pray that this child would walk in your ways all the days of their life and know you. We pray for our community, Lord, for Martha's table, that, Lord, you would feed the hungry and that the gospel message would be proclaimed through the ministry done there. Lord, provide all that is needed for this ministry and for those who are hungry. Lord, we pray for other church communities, New Norway Evangelical Free Church, Pastor Paul Warnock, and we pray for King of Glory in Calgary. Lord, bless the ministries that you are doing there. May they be fruitful and glorify your name. And Lord, we pray for Isaac and Dean Eels. Lord, bless their ministry in Muscatese. Lord, may your spirit lead them and go before them, preparing the hearts of all of those that they may have conversations with. For this and all other needs here at Resurrection and beyond, we pray and lift up to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you will turn with me, if you've got your Bibles, to Job chapter 14 for our reading today. Job 14, starting at verse 1 through 14. Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a, a, like a shadow and continues not. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me into judgment with you? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? There is not one. Since his days are determined and the numbers of his month is with you, and you have appointed his limit that he cannot pass, look away from him and leave him alone that he may enjoy like a hired hand his day. For there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that its shoot will not cease. Though its root grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low, 
Man breathes his last, and where is he? As waters fail from a lake, and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service, I would wait till my renewal should come. Here ends the reading. <clears throat> well, together and pray for Mackenzie this morning. Father, I ask that you would use your servant, Mackenzie, as he brings your word. Open our ears to hear what your spirit is saying and use Mackenzie as your vessel. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I'm Mackenzie Wall, one of the youth directors here at Resurrection, and uh, let's get to the message, shall we? A lot has happened in the book of Job since the last Sunday. Last Sunday, Pastor Jeremy walked us through chapter 3 of Job, where Job laments his birth in light of the calamity that has struck his life. Jeremy told us that Despite our desire to go around the valleys of darkness in our lives or fly over them, it is good that we walk through these valleys. And when we walk through the valley of darkness, God is walking there with us. According to Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I'm sure you have all been doing your homework and keeping up with your daily readings through Job, but a little review is always helpful to stay on track. So let's look at what has happened between last Sunday and this Sunday in our readings. Last Sunday, it was only Job who spoke, and he was not the only one there. You might remember at the end of chapter 2, Job's three friends show up. This is an important detail because the three of them do a lot of talking between chapter 3 and chapter 14. You know, I think Job's friends get a pretty bad rap. Often when we think about Job's friends, we think, man, Job had awful friends. They just show up to tell him how bad of a person he is and how what happened to him is all his fault. Mind you, they do end up saying all these sorts of things to Job. But that isn't because they're bad friends. Job had three really good friends. Job 2, 11 to 13. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Elphazaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuddite, and Zophar the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and to comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their head towards heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his suffering was very great. Job had really good friends. 
Jesus' three disciples couldn't even stay up with him a few hours the night before he was crucified. But these guys did nothing but mourn with Job for seven days and seven nights. Now the problem is that Job has three really good friends who have bad theology. It's true. Let's face it. Their actions were great. When we are lamenting, often all we need is the presence of someone else to lament with us. Nearly all the time trying to rationalize it, even if we have good theology, is not going to help. You can understand that God says in Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But that is not going to comfort you or anyone else in the middle of a loss of a friend or of a child or a spouse, or a parent. I had the privilege of hearing the testimony of a pastor who had a really successful ministry. I mean, everything was going well. The church was growing, people were walking with God, and people were being saved. One day, this pastor got on his motorbike, motorbike for a visitation, and on the way there, he was hit by a truck. The next thing he said he remembered was waking up in the hospital, his wife and his daughter at his bedside. Now this was a little odd because his daughter was attending college across the country. He discovered that he, this was the first time he'd gained consciousness in seven days. I believe he said he had broken half the bones in his body. The doctors told him he would never walk again, and he was stuck in that hospital bed for months. He said during that time in the hospital, many people visited him, but one person stood out among the rest. One of the people in his congregation would come in with two cups of ice cream and two spoons. The congregant would give the pastor a cup and a spoon, and they would eat their ice cream together. They wouldn't exchange a word. This is where Job's friends were doing it right. But then they opened their mouths. After Job's lament, his friend Alphazaz tells him all about how the innocent prosper. The implication being, of course, if Job were really innocent, calamity would have never struck him. But you right, might remember in chapters 1 and 2, the reason these things happened to Job had nothing to do with some sin he had committed or some sin he would commit. The whole situation was entirely apart. Something happening when the sons of God presented themselves before God, and Satan did as well. This reminds us of Pastor Greg's sermon two weeks ago, where one of the things he taught us is that just because something bad is happening in your life, it does not mean that they are a result of something we did. In chapters 6 through 7, Job defends himself, basically saying he didn't do anything that caused this to happen. Then his friend Bildad argues that Job needs to repent because he must have done something to deserve it. Chapters 9 through 10, Job replies, if God were his adversary, who would be his arbiter against the Almighty? Next, his friend Zophar tells Job that he actually deserves much worse than he got. 
Now, I know I said they're better friends, but it's bad theology is the problem. If Job, who was described by God as a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil, if he deserves worse, can you imagine how much worse off everybody else would be? This is one reason theology is so very important. Our understanding of God shapes the way we act and the things that we believe, the things that we think. Each of Job's friends, good friends, are earnestly expressing what they believe about God. We do the same thing. If our theology lines up with Job's friends, when something bad happens in someone's life, we think they did something to deserve it. They're in good company. Jesus' disciples had a similar theology at one time. In John 9, 1 through 3, as he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? that this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the work of God might be displayed in him. Similarly, in Luke 13, 1 through 5, there were some present at the at very time who told him about the Galileans who Pontius Pilate had mingled with their sacrament, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Often, bad things happen just because sin is in the world. Not because a person sinned a certain way or will sin in a certain way, but because sin has corrupted the world which God had made good. In Job's response this time, he says to all of them the following, Job 13, 5 through 9, Oh, that you would keep silent, and it would be your wisdom. Hear now my argument, and listen to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak falsely for God and speak deceitfully for him? Will you show partiality towards him? Will you plead the case for God? Will it be well with you when he searches you out? Or can you deceive him as one deceives a man? And then in verse 15, Though he slay me, I will hope in him, and I will argue my ways to his face. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. This does not sit well with our culture. I think it's fair to say that in our Western mindset, we think God is okay to act when it is in our benefit, but when we transgress the boundaries of being man, we try to dictate what God is allowed to do and not do when disaster falls upon us. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. What faith Job has. Now in chapter 14, 
Job is comparing his life to a landscape. He paints this verbal picture of himself. He is like a flower and he withers, verse 2. A tree cut down, verse 7. A stump that dies in the soil, verse 8. A river that dries up, verse 11. A mountain that crumbles, in verse 18. A stone worn away by water and soil that's washed away, verse 19. Job point, paints us a pretty depressing picture. We wouldn't exactly call it a Bob Ross original. We might think that Job is completely hopeless at this point. Through these verses, he's been talking about dying and going to the place of the dead, that he will be put in the ground and won't be roused from his sleep. When we are walking through the valley of darkness, it can be easy to lose our hope and think that God has abandoned us. If something bad is happening to us, it is really easy to feel hurt by God and to walk away from him. I mean, just look at why all this is happening in the first place. Satan is sure that if bad things happen to Job, he will abandon God. And I don't think this is a shot in the dark Satan is taking. He's seen it happen. It is what Satan wants. Jesus describes Satan as a murderer and a liar in John 8.44. One who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, in John 10.10. 10. When Jesus predicts Peter's three denials in Luke 22.31-32, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. This tells us what Satan wants is to destroy faith and in so doing, steal away eternal life from us, separating us from God, thus killing us. It's the same agenda he had with Adam and Eve in the garden. But the same passage also shows us what God wants for us through Christ's prayer. That in those times when Satan attacks, our faith may not fail. That is what God intends for Job as he walks through the valley of darkness. And that is what God intends for you when you are walking through the valley darkness. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Matthew 22, or 28, 20, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Satan wants you to abandon God in hardship because God has already promised that he will not abandon you. God has already promised that he will not abandon you. Psalm 139, 7 to 12, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. It's common in the Christian popular culture to equate our faith with our feelings. If we are having a mountaintop experience and we can really feel God's presence, we think He's close. When we are experiencing a season, in the wilderness, and cannot feel the presence of God, we conclude that God is not near. This is why it is important to trust God's word over our feelings. Our feelings are like the wind, changing every which way. But the word of God is a solid foundation and never changes. God promises he is with you, whether you feel it or not. The promise does not change. It's fact. Job, though he is having a very hard time, he still has hope. Chapter 14, 7 through 9, for there is hope for a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoot will not cease. Though its root grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. This is the happy little tree in Job's painting. Job trusts that God will restore him at an appointed time. God will remember him, verse 13. Till my renewal shall come, verse 14. Job seems to be describing the same hope that we have that of God's promise of resurrection, which had its first fruit on Easter morning in Christ Jesus. When heaven and earth pass away and God raises all from the dead and creates a new heaven and a new earth. John describes his vision of this in Revelation 21, 3 through 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. God doesn't just promise to be with us. He wants to be with us. That was his intent in the garden, and that is what he will, we will experience in fullness in the new creation. This is Job's hope. This is our hope. Second Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us 
preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen. I uh, invite the worship team to come up and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we have hope even in the darkest of valleys. You promise that you will be there with us, whether we feel it or not. And that we can have the same hope that Job has, that you will bring restoration, that you have not abandoned us. And this is your promise. In Jesus' name. Amen.
You know, when I'd finished preparing this sermon, I realized that it was pretty long, longer than our typical. But I only thought that that was fitting, because typically, on any given youth night, the message that either I or Sheldon bring, as you can see they're agreeing, is at least an hour long before we get to games. And if the youth can be such an example to sit patiently through that, Surely we can do it on the youth-led service this morning. Receive this benediction from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the Lord's glory has risen on you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise on you, and his glory shall be seen on you. Amen.